Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Elias, and as chairman of the speakers program, I'd like to welcome you to our ninth lecture of the fall quarter. Today, we have with us one of California's two Democratic senators. <laughs> Senator Cranston was born in Palo Alto, California in 1914. In 1936, Senator Cranston graduated from Stanford University and went to work as a foreign correspondent for the International News Service covering England, Germany, Italy, and Ethiopia. Senator Cranston was elected controller of the state of California in 1958 in his first bid for public office. He was re-elected in 1962. In 1968, Senator Cranston was elected to the Senate and is now serving on two committees, labor and public welfare and banking and currency. After his address, Senator Cranston will field questions from the floor. It is now my pleasure to introduce the senior senator from California, the Honorable Alan Cranston. Thank you very, very much, and good morning. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to be with you this morning. I deeply appreciate your presence. I thought I would talk a little bit about politics in general and some of the issues confronting us, comment on the election results of two days ago, and then I would be very happy to try to answer any questions or respond to anything you wish as, as best I can. As I came across the country about two weeks ago after serving just two fleeting years in the Senate, where we come to grips in one way or another with most of the great issues of our time and the personal problems that confront so many people in one way or another and who seek a senator's help in regard to them, I reflected on the nature of our times, not so much as they related to this particular election, but as they relate to the problems that confront us and what we can seek to do about them. We're still deeply involved in a war in Vietnam. The end is not in sight. I do not believe that the President's present policies are policies that will get us out of that war totally in any uh, particular time schedule in the future, and frankly, I do not believe that he fully intends to get us all the way out at any particular time in the future. We've been deeply involved and on the brink of deeper involvement in a very, very dangerous situation in the Middle East, and meanwhile, we're engaged in a very dangerous arms race with the Soviet Union and with China. Regretfully, I see no evidence, although I'm not privy to all that's happening, but I, based on what I do know, I see no evidence that those strategic arms limitation talks, now transferred back from Vienna to Helsinki, are seeing any really significant substantive positions or proposals made by either ourselves or the Soviet Union that would lead us toward an end to that arms race. Meanwhile, here at home, we see rising violence in the streets and across the land, stemming directly and indirectly in many ways, I believe, from the reliance upon violence and the rising violence in this world of ours. We see great concern over what some people call law and order, what I prefer to call the need for order and justice under law. We see a lack of equal opportunity, a lack of expanding opportunities for all people. We see great deprivation in one way or another in our land as well as elsewhere. We see rising concern over whether or not our institutions are able to deal with these problems, with the very severe problems of our economy, 
the fact that our economy has sagged as defense expenditures have been cut to some degree has caused many to wonder if our system requires war to work economically, a, a notion that I reject. Increasingly, with violence underlying all of this and a feeling on the part of all too many that violence is the only way to achieve change, our times seem to resemble a terrible time in the history of Rome long, long ago, described by Tacitus, the great Roman historian, as a time rent with sedition, gloomy with war, and savage in its very hours of peace. The Rome of that period went down and down and disintegrated. That could be our fate. Never before in my life have I encountered so many men of so-called substance and success who think our system is on the verge of breakdown. And yet plainly it need not be our fate. There was a time somewhat like this in England not so long ago when there was rising authoritarianism and repression because of seemingly insoluble problems and violence and unrest. It was then that Shelley wrote those words, when winter comes, can spring be far behind. And he was talking about a change in the political atmosphere that came. And England did not become a repressive nation. Our nation need not become that. Our system need not collapse. I'm in politics, let me say, first because I, blew, I grew up during the Roosevelt days when <laughs> I didn't blow up, I grew up. <laughs> when government did come to grips to a considerable degree with the great economic problems at that time and did seek to need, meet the needs of the people. Then I went and served as a foreign correspondent at a very tender age in Adolf Hitler's Germany and in Mussolini's Italy. I saw perhaps the worst government in the history of man in Germany at rather close hand. I saw democracy sort of flounder and fail in its efforts to deal with that international crisis. I quit being a newspaper man because I decided I would rather be involved in the action than simply report what others were doing. It seems to me increasingly, and I, I, I know this, I believe this to be the fact, that it is in politics and in government where the final decisions on the great issues of our time are made, can be made, should be made. All sorts of forces, of course, play their part. Concepts of, that come out of science and religion and sociology play their part. Concepts of ethics and morality and philosophy have their input. But after all these and many, many other forces have played their part, the final decisions are made through politics and through government. They're made by people who abdicate their responsibilities by not voting, by not participating, by passing the responsibility to others. Then it is the responsibility falls to those who do vote. It depends how wisely and well they vote. And then for brief moments, responsibility lies in the hands of those who occupy public elective office and a point of office at their hands for brief periods of time. But it isn't much use condemning those who are in politics or in government and who are successful in winning office because it's the people who are responsible, if the people want to make changes, to get rid of certain people in office, they have the power at the next election if they work effectively in politics to get rid of them and to get others into office. And we've seen that happen in this state Two days ago, we've seen it happen in other states across this land where the people revolted against the lack of capacity, the lack of integrity, the lack of delivery on the part of those with whom, whom they had entrusted with public office. In the days when Greece was in its glory, the politician ranked right at the forefront of society along with the philosopher, the poet, the preacher. That was true in the days when our republic was founded, when we had some truly great leaders in politics and government. Now politics somehow seems to have fallen on evil times. There's great disrespect about those in public office. A lot of jokes, of course, about their behavior and their failings. 
But this really is a responsibility that lies in the hands of the people. And I hope we can arouse enough of the people to do more and more effective action in the party of their choice with our political processes to get better and better people who will do more effective things in office in dealing with the problems of our time that often seem so out of hand and beyond the capacity of the individual to affect. I do not believe that they are beyond the capacity of the individual to affect. I do not believe that they are necessarily out of hand at the present time. I believe the system can respond. I believe we had evidence two days ago that there was response in certain places. Furthermore, I have great faith after two years in the Senate, which has been the part of the establishment, so-called, that has acted least like the establishment in certain ways for the past two years. I have great faith in that body as being a body that can provide more and more effective leadership and show that the system can respond. I assure you that there are some truly great leaders in that Senate, some truly great legislators, and I'm speaking now of both parties. We've had a moderate coalition working in that body for the past two years, and it's not really broken up by the effects of this election. It consisted of some 35 to 38 Democrats, some 12 to 15 Republicans who banded together in a, in a sort of moving coalition. You'd get certain of them on one issue, lose, but pick up others of them on some other issue. It was that body that produced, that group that produced the 50-50 vote on the anti-ballistic missile system a year and a half ago. One more vote, we would have defeated the ABM. It was that group that, group that defeated Judge Hainsworth and saved the Supreme Court from that. It was that group that defeated Judge Carswell and saved the Supreme Court from that. <laughs> it's the Senate that has provided the leadership against Vietnam, against the war in Vietnam for the past two years since the presidential campaigns when they failed to produce leadership that would stop the war. It's the Senate led by, in this respect, by Senator Muskie that has taken the tack that is now succeeding of insisting that Detroit come up with a smog-free automobile by 1975. It's the, it's the Senate here led by Senator George McGovern that has led the battle against hunger in our land. It's the Senate led here by Senator Hughes of Iowa that has led the way in a new compassionate understanding approach to the problems of alcoholism and narcotics in our society. And I could cite many, many other leaders and issues where the Senate has moved out in front. And let me say of those 12 to 15 Republicans, we lost one in Charles Goodell in New York, due, I fear, to the one effective thing that uh, Vice President Agnew did during the campaign although they only won there because there was a split. There were more moderate liberal votes cast than there were conservative votes for Buckley. But there's some great Republicans in that group, Republicans whom I would never lift a finger to oppose and to whose states I would never go to campaign against them when they are running because we need responsible, responsive Republicans as well as Democrats in public office if we are ha to have success in dealing with the issues of our time. One of the key issues relating to the Senate and its effectiveness relates to the rising specter in our land of an all-powerful president. I think this arises out of uh, two particular aspects of what is happening. One is the incredibly intricate problems that confront us beyond the comprehension of many people, the need for rather swift decisions in regard to them, the need for one man that can make decisions at various times without waiting for a legislature to spend a substantial length of time debating the pros and cons, and also the media with the incredible impact of television and also of radio have tended to build up the power of the president as against the more amorphous, diffused leadership in the legislative branch. However, we fought the American Revolution, or our forefathers did, against the concept of an all-powerful, 
one man in government against the concept of a king or a tyrant or an emperor. Now we see one particular approach to changing that in the idea that the commander-in-chief is unchallengeable, that in time of war, whether it's declared or undeclared, as we have an undeclared war in Vietnam, that the Congress cannot interfere with his decisions. That was the tactic used to defeat the so-called amendment to end the war. That was the tactic used in an effort to defeat the Cooper Church Amendment after the unfortunate invasion of Cambodia by American forces. And it's tough to deal with that. It's tough to deal with the president when he says, as commander-in-chief, it's my responsibility to defend the lives and protect Americans overseas on a field of battle. But it's also dangerous to let the president have that authority unchallenged. The Constitution did not provide that it was to work in that way. The Congress was given power to declare war or not to declare it, given power to end war by exerting the power of the purse to withhold funds for an unwanted conflict, which is the tack we've been seeking to follow in winding up the Vietnam War. And there are great dangers in that are known throughout history to man that are even perhaps greater now in some ways in our land with the vast difficulty of the problems that confront us and the power of television, radio, and the other media to strengthen the president. One of the great problems has been described in, in very, very interesting ways by men who have been at close hand with presidents recently in the White House and observe, have observed what happens to them as they are imprisoned there, and they are imprisoned there in many ways. George Reedy, who was there with President Johnson, spoke of the inflation of presidential ego that inevitably occurs under present circumstances, and with the consequent distortion of presidential judgments that follows. He spoke of the popular disillusionment in the land as presidents fail to make wise decisions and to handle our problems effectively all too often. He spoke of the following apathy among the citizens, a feeling that things are out of control, that nobody's in charge and perhaps nobody can be in charge. I believe our responsibility in the Senate and in the land, backing up the President and the House, is to help the House and the Senate restore the co-equal nature of these two coordinate branches of government to share responsibility for decision making. And the key issue relates in the war, to the war in Vietnam at the moment, but it goes beyond that to many, many other issues of vast significance in our society. As to the mood of the American people, where we are headed, what they will allow new leadership with new ideas to do, I think there have been two myths that have become rather widespread in our land. Happily, I think they were somewhat demolished day before yesterday. The first is the myth that the United States has turned to the right, to the radical far right, under the domination of a silent, selfish, conservative majority. The second is the myth that political success will come to those who read the polls correctly and who tell the people and offer the people exactly what they seem to want, even if that may not be what leaders really believe they need. I'm convinced that these are both myths. I'm convinced that the American people yearn for courageous, creative leadership in dealing with the vast problems confronting the world in the time we walk the earth together. I'm convinced that the American people long for excellence in their leaders, that they yearn for excellence in their own lives, that they want a full voice in, in their own affairs and in their own lives, relating to the personal problems one can make, along with the problems that you make through process of government, where it takes more than an individual to make a decision. I'm convinced that they want peace on earth in Vietnam and beyond Vietnam in the earth itself. 
And I'm convinced also that you need not and should not, certainly, speak to the American people rather coldly, as some have sought to do, in terms of law and order, or anarchy that became a phrase in the recent campaign. I believe that you can speak to them warmly in terms of a different concept, in terms of the concept of order and justice under law, and that you can strike a responsive chord and meet a true need if that's the approach you take. I'm convinced that the people want pure air, clean water, unpoisoned food, that they know that it's going to be rather inconvenient and costly in some ways to achieve this, but that they are prepared for those inconveniences and they are prepared to pay the price. I'm convinced the American people see the need for equal and expanding opportunity for all people, that they know pragmatically that none of us will be truly free until all are free, that they know that none will now know tranquility and peace until all, everywhere, in our land and in other lands, know true tranquility and peace based upon institutions responsible to the people, capable of ensuring that we have that tranquility and peace. Two years ago, I ran a race for the Senate based upon these premises against a man that had quite different views, <clears throat> and I managed to win. Just two days ago, a great many more races in this state and in other states were run upon these premises. And a significant number of victories were again won by those who believed in basically these same things. There was very, very plainly, whatever those who seek to apologize may seek to say and cite and point out, there was very, very plainly a failure on the part of the low-level type of campaigning carried on primarily by the Vice President, but plainly with the consent and toward the end the total collaboration and participation of the President. They set a tone that was then followed by others for lesser offices across the land right down to the Assembly and to the nonpartisan community level. It did not work. The idea of blaming the Democrats for anarchy and disorder and violence, plainly nonsense to seek to blame the Democratic Party, the party of Robert Kennedy and, Rob and jo John Kennedy for disorder, did not work. And the efforts to mislead the people backfired. They backfired in part, I believe, because other candidates offered something better and showed more faith in the wisdom of the people. I think they backfired also because the predominant issue was not violence here or violence in Vietnam. The predominant issue became the economy and the failures of this administration to stem inflation and the fact that the policies they, with the best of intentions, using, resorted to to stem inflation had the worst of results, didn't stop inflation, did cause increasing unemployment for a couple of millions of Americans and a threat that faces more, and great hardships and bankruptcies for the business community. Here in California, we saw a sort of a populist campaign against Governor Reagan waged by Jess Unruh on economic issues fail for a variety of reasons, but it succeeded in whittling down the margin of Governor Reagan, and it succeeded, I think, in helping some other Democrats win. We saw John Tunney prevail against a campaign that he has termed a campaign based upon fear and the suggestion of anarchy. There were other issues, of course, involved. Personality became an issue. Certain alleged conflicts of interest became an issue, but the fact is that Tunney won a very strong victory and astoundingly in a state that was said to be a state that had veered far to the right when Reagan, Murphy, and Rafferty assumed their offices and when they captured the state legislature, California now not only has two Democratic senators who are moderate in their approach to the issues or, quote, liberal, unquote, by definition of many, 
but California actually has the first, for the first time, two Democratic senators since the election of 1861. In the congressional races, we saw a remarkable victory by Ron Dellums. who was singled out as one of the prime targets of Vice President Agnew, another of his failures. We saw a black man not only win there, but in the race for superintendent of public instruction for the... <laughs> that victory was not only a great personal victory for a truly great, highly qualified man, Wilson Riles, but it was the first time that an incumbent superintendent of public instruction has ever lost a race in California, and I believe it was the first time that a black has ever won a constitutional statewide office in an election in any state in America since Reconstruction. We do have Senator Brooke, a black serving in the Senate for Massachusetts, but that's a national office, not a state office. And I do not believe that the race was only a race against a discredited Max Rafferty, because the first poll showed Max somewhere up around 48 percent and Riles only 7 percent. As he waged an effective race, as he became known, as the people learned not only that he was black, but that he was a man of stature, his strength rose to the point where he could win. And I think this is a great indication, first, of the fact that the people of California, like the people of West Virginia in the presidential primaries of 1960, are not prejudiced, that they will vote for a man regardless of race or creed if they believe he is the most re responsible, effective man in a contest for public office. And it bodes well for the sign that our institutions can respond, that they are open to any who bring to them capacity and courage and creativity. In the state legislature, we likewise made, I think, very significant gains. One seat was picked up by a so-called brown candidate down in San Diego, another door opening for a so-called minority group. Nationally, President Nixon failed in his key target taking control of the Senate. He failed to capture the House. The Democrats gained there. And the Democrats made great gains in the governorships, again, I think, because of a failure of the Southern strategy. It simply did not work in the South. Because of rising strength in the Middle West, strangely, the principal Democratic gains seemed to be in the East that, under the Southern strategy, the Republicans had decided to sort of write off and ignore although the gain they made in New York, I repeat, only came because there were two liberals against one conservative. In the largest states of our union, we made impressive gains in California, in Illinois, where Adlai Stevenson won. And that was against one of the most vicious, vicious law and order races in the entire land. In Ohio, where we the Democrats won the governorship and where they waged a very close Senate race against a great name, Taft, in Ohio politics. In Pennsylvania, the Democrats won the governorship and gave Hugh Scott, the very fine Republican leader, a man of moderation and, lib and liberalism, a close race in the Senate. I believe all this shows that the system can work, that it can be made to work, that it is responsive, that it is open, although we have a long, long way to go to achieve more, to get more men of substance and creativity and courage into public office. But if more people work hard, we can do that. I have been utterly astounded after seeing dictatorship at close hand in Italy and in Germany, and then participating in our democracy, beginning at the grassroots level, where first of all, I was a precinct chairman in charge of get out the vote in my home county of Santa Clara, I've been astounded, not only by what I've happened to be able to do, but by what so many others have been able to do, observing them closely, how rapidly someone 
who works hard at it and who thinks out what he's doing can achieve vast effect at the local level and on up to the statewide and the national level in influencing the course of American politics on the issues of our time. I grant that somehow in view of the dimensions of our problems, the crisis of war, not just in Vietnam, but uh, the crisis of the arms race and the threat of nuclear catastrophe, the threat of hunger, the threat to the environment, the threat to the ecology, the vast threats posed by ignorance and poverty amidst richness and brilliance. Sometimes you have to wonder whether we will be able to survive, whether freedom can prevail and provide without dictatorship, without all the perils and threats and awfulness of dictatorship, a decision-making process that can function. I believe that it can, and in my own moments of sometime doubt, I like to think back to a moment in the early days of our own task of founding our own republic, when after the War of the Revolution, the Founding Fathers gathered at Philadelphia in an effort to form a more perfect union. There were many that felt that it couldn't be done, that America was destined to become a sort of a balkanized continent with 13 or more separate sovereign nations, each with its own emperor or king or tyrant or president, each with its own system of laws, each with its own tax systems, each with its own armies, and wars one against the other. That convention seemed destined to fail even after it had been convened. The delegates from one of the 13 original states never showed up. The delegates from two more gave up and went home. The convention seemed on the verge of collapse and failure. And then George Washington rose to his feet at a crucial moment in that, con in that convention. He said a very few words which were the turning point. He uttered them. The men there buckled to the task. They forged the Constitution under which we have ever since managed to live. And his few words ring down to the present moment, to the present crisis, to the present opportunity with amazingly direct overtones and undertones. All that he said was this, it is, too it is too probable that no plan we propose will be adopted. Perhaps another dreadful conflict is to be sustained. But if, to please the people, we offer that which we ourselves disapprove, how can we afterward defend our work? Let us raise a standard to which the wise and the honest can repair. The event is in the hand of God. I add that the event is in your hands, and I thank you. Uh, before we take questions, I'd like to make two announcements, if I may. Uh, you're all invited back here Monday when we will have Senator Strom Thurmond here. Uh, we will set up the maximum setup here, uh, which is about 1,500. Anybody who can't get in is invited to listen to it in Royce Hall. Also, uh, on Thursday, a week from today, we will have Israel's Foreign Minister, Abba Iban, speaking in Pauli Pavilion. The, tic the event will be ticketed, but tickets are free, and you can pick them up by showing your ID card at the Kirchhoff Hall ticket office. All right, let's take some questions from the floor now. Uh, we, have, we have a mic somewhere, don't we? All right, let's have the first question. Um, how do you plan to stop the population explosion in the United States? Are you in favor of uh, Senator Packwood's bill, for instance, to legalize abortion on demand? And are you also in favor of abolishing tax credit limitations, for instance, uh, instead of having uh, $600 deductions after for uh, tax deductions for kids, are you in favor of eliminating that after the second child? 
Did you all hear the question? I rather doubt that the tax credit would have any significant effect upon the birth rate, and I'm, I'm not particularly interested in that approach. I have been a co-sponsor and supported not the Packwood bill, but the tidings bills, and unfortunately there, a man who's provided great leadership went down to defeat for quite different reasons in the Maryland senatorial election. I believe that we must spend a great deal of money and time and effort on so many things that relate to the well-being of our society rather than the destructive purposes of war and the arms race, and one of the keys is more, run, more money on more effective birth control methods, and I am for a totally crash program there. I'm for making that information available to all those who wish it. I'm for doing everything we can to persuade the American people that we must get to population zero growth until we figure out what we can sustain in this land and elsewhere. I have supported the earlier abortion bills which were introduced and the one that was enacted by Senator Bielenson. Frankly, I am not yet convinced that there should be totally free and open abortion under the law, and I will tell you why. I just am not quite ready to accept in this time of violence with the lack of reverence for life, with the lack of reverence for the individual and his own integrity to accept the violence of abortion condoned by the state free and openly for what may be the most frivolous or inconsiderate reasons. I don't want to get into arguments about when life begins or when it does not. I, I don't really know that and you can argue in many, many ways, but it's my reverence for the life of the individual that gives me some pause as to whether this is sort of a fad, a thing of the moment about free and open abortion that we may have some second thoughts about as we move away from the violence of our times. And so I simply have reservations. I haven't thought that through all the way yet. I believe we have a question over there. Senator, Senator Cranston, uh, Senator-elect Tunney has said that if no one else does, he will propose uh, an amendment or a proposal in the Senate like the McGovern-Hatfield Amendment, which would uh, be an anti-war amendment. Would you support such an amendment? And if Tunney does not follow through on his promise, would you sponsor such an amendment? Well, four of the five original sponsors will return to the Senate. Unfortunately, Senator Goodell will not be there. But Senator McGovern, Senator Hatfield, Senator Hughes and I were the other original sponsors of that measure. We have presently been consulting as to what would be the best new approach to an amendment or a legislative action that would give the Congress the responsibility for sharing responsibility with the President and winding down that war. I will support whatever we agree upon. If John Tenney happens to come up with the best formula, I will support that one. If somebody else comes up with a better one, I will support that one. I will support any reasonable effort because we must end that war. I do not believe that we are presently ending it under present approaches, and I believe it will only be done by initiative coming from the Congress. Unfortunately, we are one or two votes weaker than we were in, uh, on the day when we voted on the McGovern Hatfield of the Amendment to End the War Amendment in the last session of Congress. However, while we only got 39 registered votes cast, there were 40 actually for Senator Moss was out campaigning, and I'm glad he was because he won. He was with us. There were eight, nine, or 10 more votes we might have gotten. Some we just didn't manage to figure out how to get. There were three or four others that we thought might be with us down to the last moment, and they decided for their own reasons that they could not be with us. We have been within striking distance of passing such an amendment. I believe we are stronger now in the House than we were before the election, although we are still short, I think, of a majority. Frankly, I fear that we need to wait the, await the development of events that give new momentum to the effort to end the war. It is, it is sort of on the back burner unhappily at the moment. I think we will need to face some sort of a new crisis there, and I believe we will, unfortunately and unhappily, face a new crisis in Vietnam 
When that comes, we may have a new surge of strength and may be able to go further, but I assure you that I and those others, including John Tony and Ed Muskie, who is also a member of the leadership in this, will be searching for the time and the vehicle for forcing the President's hand and ending that war. If you have, if you have a question, uh, you're encouraged to get up and get to the side of the auditorium so you could uh, speak into the microphone. All right, uh, we have another question uh, yes. over Senator, here. Senator, will you please comment Will you please comment on the recent election eve appeals by President Nixon and Senator Muskie and the recent veto by the President of limitations on election media spending? Well, first, I think the President was very inept in his appeals on election eve. Not only did he not perform well, but his substance was unwisely chosen, the appeal to the law and order issue that simply did not work. I think they failed to develop the so-called San Jose uproar in ways that would redound to their effectiveness. I think people saw through them and saw that they were looking for some such opportunity and may have had something to do with the fact that it got a bit more out of hand than, than such a situation should. I think that Ed Muskie made a very, I, frankly, I did not see it. I was too busy doing some other things that night. But as I understand it, Ed Muskie made a magnificent appeal. And I think he should be given some credit for what happened the next day. I am gravely concerned about the role of television in politics and in government, as I indicated in my earlier remarks. I supported the bill vetoed by the president that would have limited the money that can be spent on television advertising. I, I will vote to override the veto. Whether we can succeed or not, I do not know. I do not think that's the only answer. Some have suggested that we should eliminate the 30-second and the one-minute spot television announcement and campaigning and re require the candidate himself to be on TV for at least five minutes talking about issues or presenting himself in whatever way he wishes so the people have time to size him up and don't just get sort of a subliminal impression from 10 seconds of skillfully produced television designed to present an image that may not be the image that really reflects that man. I was discussing this oddly enough with Senator Tidings before he lost. He was very upset about the use of TV in his campaign and said that my opponent never appears. They don't show him. They just show some skillful Hollywood to type stuff that gives an image of him on the issues that has nothing to do with what he is. And he said, we should insist that the candidate has to be there. Well, I told him that we in California, after our experience with acting governors and acting senators, might like exactly the opposite kind of a law. Uh, we have a question on this side. Uh, Senator Cranston, uh, what lead will you take in making the Democratic National Convention more democratic? I have not been involved in the, in the Reform Commission, but Governor, or former Governor Senator Hughes and Senator McGovern have been doing magnificent work, and they tell me with very great cooperation from Larry O'Brien, the National Chairman, in writing rules and preparing proposed changes in the law that would democratize the Democratic National Convention open it up far more to the will of the people, get rid of anachronistic laws and laws that require the decision to be made two years before the convention even convenes on delegations. I will support every effort that is made in any forum designed to open up the Democratic Party and make it as close as it can be to the grassroots, to its membership, and responsive to the issues that emerge at the time of the convention and the campaign. Uh, we have time for about two more questions, and if they're short, maybe three. Uh, let's take one on this side. Senator Cranston, I'd like to ask you what consequences you would foresee if the Senate and House of Representatives could force President Nixon's hand to pull out all the troops, say, by July 1st of next year. What do you think would happen in Vietnam? Well, I do not now expect time having elapsed that we would be able to get through Congress an amendment requiring the troops to be out within six months, which is what you're talking about, or even less. I think we would have to have something that would require at least a year to get them out 
for logistical and other reasons and to give South Vietnam that much more time to face the fact that they finally have to stand on their own feet and defend themselves. If we did get such a thing enacted, which I think we may be able to do at some point, I fear, however, only after new developments in the war that are adverse, that we cannot foretell what will then happen. The South Vietnam government has not made the reforms and has not picked up the struggle itself because, after all, why should it when we seem willing to stay there forever defending them, which is the only conclusion they can draw from what President Nixon has thus far done, that he intends to keep substantial forces there. If they are given one year or something like that to get ready, I do not know what the results will be, although we will have to accept whatever those results are after we are, we are out. Let me very briefly tell you why I'm concerned now about what may be a very unpleasant future facing us in Vietnam. The President, for various reasons, is cutting us down to something like 285,000 troops by next spring. Those troops will be a mix of combat and support troops. They will be increasingly reliant upon the South Vietnamese for their protection. The South Vietnamese are a very slender reed to depend upon for the protection of American troops. They might not be able to defend them. And at some point, I fear, and I base this not so much on my own knowledge and information, which is amateur in, in terms of military matters, but based upon what I learned from generals and others who know a very great deal about military matters, that there is grave danger that when we are down to that remnant and have the rest of our men out, that the other side may decide to attack that remnant, particularly if we are continued to punish them with very heavy bombings in South Vietnam, in Laos, in Cambodia, and elsewhere. If they do, President Nixon may find himself faced with a very unhappy choice. A Dunkirk-like evacuation with a lot of blood spilled and heavy losses under this assault, or the military commanders there are very apt to say to the President, Mr. President, under these circumstances, we can only defend the lives of our men if you authorize us to resort to the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Knowing President Nixon, I suspect that he would tend to accept the latter as the course. This could lead to a catastrophic escalation with unforeseeable results and consequences. And it is that moment when we may have a new revulsion in this country and a new effort successful then through the Senate to end this war. Uh, we have to take our last question now from this side. Senator Cranston, in order to avoid another war in the Mideast and all the implications of a big power showdown, would you be willing to uh, run the, uh, to risk the wrath of the B'nai B'rith and support uh, the idea of a, uh, a West Bank Palestinian state and hope that may help to defuse the area? I'm willing to run the risk of any force in our society, of any constituents or constituent body, if I'm absolutely convinced that what I want is what our country must do. In regard to the Middle East, First, let me say that I do not see any parallels between Vietnam and the Middle East. I think we're talking about totally different things for endless reasons that I could spell out to you. Secondly, I do not favor and would oppose the sending of American troops into combat in the Middle East. We cannot do that. There would be very bad consequences in countless ways if we did, but I believe that we do have a deep interest there. I believe that various events, including the most recent uh, steps taken by the Nixon administration, have given us grave responsibilities to see to it that the people of Israel have the means to defend themselves in terms of weapon and support short of manpower and blood from America. The only long-range solution is one where the Arabs and the Israelis sit down and iron out their differences give Israel recognition of their right to exist, give them borders they can defend, and resolves the terribly unfortunate and almost hopeless situation of the Arab refugees. Okay, thank you, Senator Cranston, and thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>